we so thank you all for being with us uh, we are about to start our webinar uh, today uh, there are different uh, ways of interaction you will see that today it will be a very interactive uh, uh, meeting this is antonella poce and i'm talking to you from italy from rome where i teach at roma tre university department of education um, experimental pedagogy that's my my field of study i am eden fellow and i'll be a moder your moderator uh, today uh, i'm working i've been working uh, in distance education and in particular in uh, in the last five years in critical thinking assessment and enhancement and uh, that's why i'm very much interested as all of you i think in the topic uh, today you have the opportunity to meet uh, um, our our speakers uh, today uh, please be aware that you can um, ask questions and we'll try to to have more quest the most questions we can uh, live uh, with our speakers you can put your questions in the question and answer uh, um, box uh, that you can find in the bar uh, below uh, the main image you are seeing at the moment. Uh, there's a chat and you, you are already uh, using it as I can see, but the questions please leave them on the question and answer um, um, uh, box. Uh, you have uh, uh, also the uh, streaming uh, possibility on YouTube and we'll try to collect questions also uh, from there. Uh, so, uh, what are we going to talk about uh, uh, today? Um, what happens when the communication of the 2000 handcuff uh, pandemic generates a new wave of information overload. How can you help your students manage it? Um, how can you manage it yourself? Recent uh, research analyzed the level of this perception or misperception of facts due to the way uh, they are told or uh, narrated. Um, why do we tend to overestimate some information instead of others? Uh, media tend to, to attract our attention for commercial reasons. Um, news are not focused on the truth, but on the viral po power that they have. An infodemic or, of information is thus spread, and this limits our rationality and awareness of reality. It is difficult to make the right decisions, um, starting from wrong points, of course. Uh, moreover, such sort of information generates uh, addiction. And to understand how to cope with this kind of pandemic that have an impact also on health and well-being, I leave, of course, the floor to our uh, remarkable uh, speakers. Um, Irv Katz, Senior Research Director of Educational Testing Service, Princeton, New Jersey, USA. Uh, and um, Francesca Amenduni, uh, PhD student at Roma Tre University and uh, newly elected member of the Network of Academics and Professionals uh, from the EDEN, European Distance and the Learning uh, Network. Um, Irv, uh, let me say a few words about Irv Kaltz. Uh, is uh, mm, uh, Senior Research Director of the Cognitive uh, and Technology Sciences Center at the Educational Testing Service, Princeton. Throughout his almost 30-year career at ETS, is a, he has conducted research at the intersection of cognitive psychology, psychometrics and technology. His research involves developing methods for applying cognitive theory to the design of assessments, building cognitive models to guide interpretation of test takers' performance, and investigating the cognitive and psychometric implications 
of highly interactive digital performance assessments. Uh, the Cognitive and Technology Science Center that he directs comprises staff with a wide range of expertise uh, who conduct research and development at the forefront of educational assessment, serving the current and future needs of ETS programs and clients, promoting quality and equity. Current research and development areas include simulation, game scenario, and conversion based assessment, training of human raters, theoretically driven analysis of test taker process data for reporting and cognitive model. So um, I leave the floor uh, to you uh, here uh, and I thank you so much for being with us today. After uh, Irv's uh, presentation, uh, we'll ask a few, very few questions to hear, and then we'll leave the floor to Francesca and have again uh, an interactive session with her. Thank you so much to both of you. Please, Irv, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Antonella. And thank you to Antonella, Francesca, and our colleagues at Eden for this opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about digital information literacy as a type of um, vaccine or inoculation against the infodemic. Information literacy, digital information literacy represents a type of critical thinking, and I'll discuss a little bit more about the um, what it is, uh, the types of tasks we've used to assess it, and the type, and therefore the types of instruction that might be used to teach these types of skills. And I hope we'll have an interesting conversation about how to um, have students be more digitally information literate. There's a couple of takeaways um, that I'm going to return to at the end of the presentation uh, that I'd like you to think about as I go through the presentation. First off, often when we think about digital literacy, we often think about just evaluation of information. Is this information I'm reading about on a website, in the news, or on a tweet? Is this, is this real? Is this biased in some way? And I'd like to point out that digital information, what I'll discuss is how digital literacy includes, is a full range of skills, not just evaluation. In addition, although digital literacy is digital and related to technology, certainly, it is very much a cognitive skill. These types of skills I'll be discussing today have been discussed for years. They were first defined in some ways in the 1970s, Later, uh, there have been other developments uh, in the 90s, and then even um, more recently in 2000, 2010, they've been returned to again and again uh, as a way of dealing with um, information and evaluating information and finding information and build in order to build knowledge. Finally, uh, the other point I want I'll be talking about is that digital, inf digital literacy, digital information literacy is integrated. Although I'll talk about various types of skills that, that comprise in, uh, digital literacy, they should be thought of all as part of a single whole. It's not a piecemeal set of skills that you can be better or worse on. These skills tend to travel together. People tend to be good at the skills overall, not so good at the skills uh, or not so good at the skills. Um, so although there are these different facets of digital literacy, you should think of them all as one integrated set of skills. So a key point that I, that I wanna make is that digital literacy is more than technology skills. Certainly nowadays, uh, students are very facile with technology. They're able to, um, they, they tweet, they use Instagram, Facebook for, for us older folks, um, email, and so forth. There's a wide website, there's a wide range of uh, technology that, that is being used, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. People need to be able to judge the authenticity of information that they see. They, should, they need to be able to organize uh, information and summarize and adapt information when they are, because people are not only consumers of information, they're also producers of information. So they should be able to 
communicate information effectively, disseminate that information, understand where to go for more information to get uh, more ideas about what they might be um, reading. And you can think of all of these skills related to technology, but it's really a type of critical thinking that I think Francesca will be talking uh, more, more about. So what is digital information literacy? What does it consist of? These seven skills uh, on, uh, on the right, defining, accessing, evaluating, manage, integrate, create, and communicate, uh, were uh, defined originally as part of digital information literacy uh, by an international panel, actually back in about uh, 2000, 2001. Um, and later refined by representatives of uh, US colleges and universities, primarily people involved in the uh, libraries at US colleges and universities. Librarians for many years, librarians have been the uh, keepers of what might be thought of as information, information literacy. What makes uh, good information, how to find um, reliable information, how to define an information need, this is all part and parcel of what uh, happens as uh, um, what librarians are trained to do. And we work with a lot of librarians from across the US as well as other faculty members when defining these uh, digital literacy and what, it, what, it, what it's made of. So what are some of these skills? The one that most people talk about and think about when they think about the infodemic is evaluating information. And I'll just go through a couple of these skills right now, but we can talk more about them during the Q&A. So evaluating information is determining the degree to which information satisfies a particular need. In this case, for example, finding out about current numbers about testing um, for the uh, coronavirus, finding out whether or not uh, policies that are being implemented by uh, governments are actually real. There's a lot of uh, new fake news uh, nowadays. And so a lot of the, uh, this is all part and parcel of types of evaluating. A key thing that I, I always think about when it comes to evaluating information, and Francesca got at this in her introductory remarks, is why is the person who created this information, um, why is this person um, uh, communicating it? What's, what, what's in it for them? Uh, in some cases, it might be an altruistic idea of providing information to, um, for the benefit of many people. In other cases, there might be a, political, a particular political or a social uh, slant on the information. That doesn't mean that the information is necessarily problematically biased, but it does mean that you have to think about who created this information. So activities that might be involved on everyday basis, evaluating information, selecting the best database or websites in order to find information, find reliable information. Uh, someone might be uh, ranking web pages, evaluating web pages in terms of their authority, their relevance to a particular research question how biased they are, and determining, uh, also part of this is determining whether the information that you've collected when you're building some, uh, some understanding of some issue, whether that's sufficient. Another important type of skill is integrating information. That is taking information from multiple sources and forming some type of uh, summary or conclusions. For example, synthesizing information from a website into a tweet. And this is something we see a lot of where people might draw information, draw ideas from a number of different websites and summarize them somehow in 280 characters. Comparing and contrasting information from a variety of sources, news, social media, and so forth in the spreadsheet. Just as one example to try to understand that we as researchers might do this to try to understand a particular issue. Uh, and then just drawing conclusions from all the onslaught of information that we get, whether it be emails, tweets, Instagram, web pages, or print, 
um, on particular issues and trying to understand that. This is another aspect of digital information literacy, integrating these uh, pieces of information together. And the last um, one that I'm going to uh, speak about, um, the, sorry, I was looking at the uh, Q&A, uh, very interesting question that I'll get to uh, near the end and I, I agree with. Um, communicating information, communication. People are not just consumers of information, they're also producers of uh, information, they communicate. And understanding not only how to create um, TikTok videos, tweets, uh, inter um, other video mashups, websites, and so forth, but how to communicate them appropriately to an audience, to tell them to an, the audience, to tell them to the particular approach that you want to uh, take, how you create a tweet and how you think about a tweet is very different than how you think about a presentation, for example. These are all a part and parcel of digital information literacy. So, creating a graph that helps you uh, think of, um, to help you make a decision or to understand better about some issue. We've seen a lot of that, uh, particularly lately in the uh, news. Adapting presentation slides to a new audience, how you would present to a uh, set of students versus to a set of colleagues would be, for example, very different. So I'm gonna turn now to um, some examples of these types of skills and uh, how they might look. Um, I should say that these were created for an assessment that was specifically designed for use in the U.S. Uh, my examples are, I recognize them U.S. centric. However, the basic ideas behind them, I think if uh, understanding the basic ideas behind them means that it's, uh, you know, you'll see that with some small changes, you can probably, you can make them more uh, globally relevant uh, pretty easily. So the first task is related to evaluating information. Uh, the idea is to require, it requires students to think critically about information found on the internet. And the scenario here provides the context for evaluating the information. For each of several websites, the students are asked to decide the usefulness of the site's information, its relevance, its timeliness, the authority, uh, point of view, and so forth. So here, for example, you're finding, you want to find unbiased information about uh, global warming. Um, and as a research step, you've identified several potential promising sites. Now you need to decide whether these sites are reliable and relevant. So there are a variety of websites given um, in this uh, task and it's up on top and there's a uh, scrolling. And then down at the bottom, you indicate whether the sites are useful, authoritative, not authoritative, potentially biased and so forth. So just to focus on one of these tasks, one of these uh, scientific panel funded by a consortium of state utility companies uh, about uh, information uh, about climate change, and you could say, well, this one, number one, it might not be completely um, uh, current because it's about 10, 10 years old or so, uh, 15 years old, um, but also it's potentially problematically biased because of the uh, source of the information. Uh, another is a, um, a, the results of a climate chain, uh, change uh, panel, but it was way back in 1995, although many of these issues are relevant, it might be that these are uh, not in fact uh, current and the current and best information that we have nowadays. So you can see how you could adapt uh, and develop new types of tasks that would be better suited to, um, to current uh, issues, but still, and maybe in a, in a different frame, but with different technologies such as tweets and Instagram and so forth, but still get at the same basic underlying skills of evaluation in this case. Here's another uh, type of skill that's, um, that's more along the lines of searching for information because when we receive information, 
when we're deciding, okay, should I believe this? Part of that decision process, part of that thinking, the critical thinking about information is to go out and find additional information that either that might uh, support what we're seeing, the conclusions we're seeing, or to give us a broader understanding. So here's uh, a very simple task where you're working, you're taking a class in history, the US Constitution. Again, I said this was um, US-based uh, uh, questions, but you can make this really about anything you'd like. Um, and your colleagues uh, are all um, have suggested ways of um, searching, alternative ways of searching rather than the search given right here. And the idea is for you to figure out, well, what's the best solution? What's the best way of search, starting off a search on this particular issue related to the U.S. Constitution? Here are some um, uh, iMessages, IMs, texts from friends about some suggestions. What's important here is not that this is effectively a multiple choice question. What's important here is that the different options uh, result in broader or narrower ways of finding information. For example, a very broad thing was just adding, uh, we should try searching this one in the lower right. We should try searching on history of the U.S. Constitution. That would get you a lot of information. And then there's the correct answer, which is to just put quotes around the specific thing you want to find so that you find those specific um, uh, texts with those specific words would give you the most. And then the other two provide, um, provide uh, narrower but not narrow enough of uh, types of uh, results. And we're interested in seeing how well people can rank order these different options. Uh, interestingly enough, um, when when we've done these this uh, used this assessment, um, generally people, even on something as simple as this, uh, tend not to be good at these skills. And we found this generally with many of the uh, skills. So in this case, the correct answer was found by about 36% of um, college students. Um, and this has been replicated a number of different times. Uh, admittedly, not necessarily immediately recently. Some people might be better at this now, but it's been fairly, uh, fairly stable. So to, um, to conclude, let me turn back to my takeaways. Uh, first, digital literacy includes a full range of skills, not just evaluation. This is suggesting for for you all that when teaching about digital information literacy, instruction should be broad, not just focusing on one or the other of different pieces of what might go into uh, digital literacy, but should cover a wide range of skills. Digital literacy uh, is cognitive, not just about technology. Instruction should try to focus on the cognitive skills, not just on how you determined uh, for example, the um, how you search for more information through Twitter or through Google or so forth, but actually um, try to try to look beyond the specific technology um, to the actual cognitive skills that underlie digital literacy. And finally, as I said before, digital literacy is integrated. It's not these piecemeal things. Often instruction tends to focus, um, when I've worked with um, instructors in the past, tend to focus on one or the other of these uh, various skills to the detriment of, of some of them. The instruction should not only be integrated, but pervasive. Um, I've worked with faculty at universities who've, engaged, who've worked with uh, the library uh, at their universities to help develop for a wide variety of different types of classes, appropriate digital information literacy instruction and ass uh, assignments that would not only be integrated, not only focus on the cognitive, but work within a, for example, a history course. A, um, a writing course, um, a speaking course, and so forth. So the any a biology course. Um, librarians have very good ideas about how information and literacy appears in a variety of domains and working with them to help develop um, 
projects and assignments that train digital literacy is a, uh, is a good idea. So just some discussion points that we might raise in the Q&A or for you to all think about. So digital literacy tends to be very difficult to teach, and I'm, I'm curious as to people's ideas about the type of instruction that best leads to the sort of skeptical eye that you want people to have um, in order to evaluate information. And then we recognize that it's really hard. We learn something in the classroom, but then when we're out in the real world, it's really hard to apply the skills that we've uh, learned in the classroom. And so a question is for you all, how can we encourage, how can we teach in a way that helps the students recognize when these skills can be applied in everyday life? I'll leave my contact information down there. And with that, um, thank you very much. And I will, um, I'll, I'll turn it back to Antonella, or should I answer some of the questions in the, in the chat? So I'll go to the Q and A. To unmute my my mic. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation uh, here. Uh, yes, there are uh, different, very interesting um, questions coming from from the audience, and uh, I wish you could uh, um, ask to um, the yes, the, this uh, this this question. Um, especially if that is in, in the chat, and I think you can read it. Emotional exploitation of illiterate through fake videos is a serious threat for political ends by anonymous experts. How to evaluate it as a fake, conspiracies behind it, and deal with, with it? I think this is a really um, a relevant, relevant question, and also uh, what you highlighted related to the connection between digital literacy and uh, what we got uh, continuously uh, on our uh, personal devices is is really threatening. So, can you can you give us some advice regarding that? This is a really good, relevant point mm. that we've seen a lot of lately, especially with the um, ability to create what, what's now been calling deep fake videos. Um, one, of the, one of the approaches that, I, that I've taken when I, when I look at these is not only is to, um, number one, always look for the source of the information. How much do we know about who, who is either posting this or where this information came from? Um, that will in turn lead you to, um, to, and if you can't find the source of any information or it's, um, there's no way to find out about the organization or what have you that created it, then you, you, you obviously need to doubt the uh, information. But the other, the, the trickier one is that what if we are seeing these um, fake videos um, that actually are showing things that we agree with? That's actually probably one of the cases where students need to think more carefully about they're seeing some video, they're going along with it, and those are the ones where we're most likely to be fooled because it's agreeing with our worldview. And those are the ones where it's most important to uh, seek who is the author of this and what potential um, um, ideas that this person is trying to promote. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, the the issue uh, there is is exactly uh, that uh, the media are tending to um, to focus on what can be viral, and so they 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 focus on uh, not not tracing the truth, but going uh, to find people's. Um, agreement. So, what what's more, more most popular uh, will be uh, most viral, and that's the thing that we we should look for um, in in our way of uh, uh, transferring information to our to our students, but also enhancing their critical thinking skills. And we are going to to learn more about that with uh, Francesca's presentation. But I want to pick up. Uh, another question from the audience, and then we'll uh, we'll move uh, uh, we'll move um, uh, to the second presentation. But I'm telling the audience that uh, 
we are going to answer, uh, we'll try to answer all of your questions uh, um, also uh, afterwards. So don't worry if we are not going to, to ask all the questions to our presenters. Um, another question is that um, when, from Vlad, when digital literacy skills are very low, it is difficult to protect oneself from the infodemic or, or fake or irrelevant news. Could you point us to a free online course for people who have low digital literacy skills or maybe a European, European will be difficult maybe uh, for for you to ask to answer, but but we'll we'll try to to answer uh, about that also with uh, uh, Francesca. But Irv, can you tell us um, how can we protect from the infodemic or fake or irrelevant news? Something you already told us, but um, well. I'm afraid that I don't know, so I'm more in the assessment world than in the instructional world, although I've worked with um, colleges and uh, university professors before. Um, but I do know that um, UNESCO at one point several years ago had developed a information literacy, digital information literacy, I think at the time they called it ICT literacy um, instruction. I don't know what the current state of that uh, is, is right is though um i can certainly um yeah i'm sorry i, I don't have a, i don't have a good answer for that um but, but if anybody but, else in the audience does yeah <laughs> but 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 francesca i'm sure will give us more uh, more information about that there are different also different european projects developed to uh, try to answer uh, and to give some directions uh, um, the other, the, the last one, and then we'll leave the floor to Francesca. Um, how would you differentiate digital literacy from digital fluency? Well, it really, the, the words themselves are not, uh, I've heard these exact skills, and in fact, these exact skills I've discussed as digital fluency. The words change a lot, digital literacy, digital information literacy, ICT literacy. Um, the hard part, and you could say the same thing about uh, critical thinking, which I believe is the, the topic of Francesca's talk, it really boils down to not the label, but the uh, how you define the specific skills. Um, are you focusing more on the technology and the facility with the technology? Uh, sometimes people use that digital fluency to mean that, um, but or are you focusing more on the uh, cognitive skills that that exist uh, beyond a particular um, uh, particular technology. Yes, thank you so much here. So we'll try to be back to both of you in the end if there will be time so to have the possibility to answer more more questions. Uh, but uh, I'm going to introduce you in a minute. Uh, Francesca uh, Amenduni, as I said, she is a uh, um, um, PhD student at Roma 3 University, but newly elected member of the Network of Academics and Professionals uh, Eden uh, Network. Um, she studies, she's, she's a PhD student in education, culture and communication at Roma 3 University. She has developed her expertise in the learning field, both as practitioner uh, and researcher at national and international level. She carried out research on blended learning and her current PhD project regards semi-automated assessment of critical thinking, short essays, and open-ended answers. Uh, part of her research has been developed at ETS Princeton, uh, where she spent a term period as visiting student, uh, funded by the Italian Ministry of Education and Research through the Leonardo da Vinci Scholarship. Um, I can add also that she was one of the very, very few uh, PhD students all over the country to, to get this scholarship. So uh, uh, we have to congratulate her for that. And she has been working as a researcher in several European projects in the field. So that's why uh, I was telling you uh, in advance that she's going to give you some 
feedback on where to collect information about courses related to um, digital skills enhancement support and especially cross-sectional skills development. So Francesca, the floor is all yours, please. Thank you. I will share my presentation. You can see. No, okay, sorry. Sorry, okay, now you can see my presentation. One moment, okay. Okay, um, thank you to be here with me today. Uh, today I feel more than ever the responsibility of what I'm saying, and I will try to share reliable and trustworthy information because I don't want to contribute negatively to the current infodemic. So I will speak, uh, I will provide you a definition of what infodemic is, and I also will try to speak with you about some uh, research results of the current infodemic. Then we will speak about uh, uh, two antibodies for uh, infodemic that uh, I think that could be critical thinking and uh, digital literacy. And uh, finally, we will speak also about innovative methods to assess critical thinking and digital literacy. So, um, um, we know that the current uh, pandemic is strongly related with technological progress, for better and uh, for worse. One of the facts of the technological progress related with information is also known as information overload. The idea is that with internet, we receive more information that, than uh, the information that our mind can understand and uh, process. When the, the phenomenon of information overload meet pandemic, we uh, are in front of uh, what World Health Organization call infodemic. Infodemic was defined as an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and re reliable guidance when they need it. But why World Health Organization interested in infodemic? Uh, uh, war, uh, the World Health Organization is interested because of the danger of misinformation during the management of virus outbreaks, since it could even speed up the epidemic process by influencing and fragmenting social response. Here I'm showing you some uh, pictures of examples of fragmentation of social response that can create danger for singular individuals, but also for a group of people. Uh, the World Health Organization has been trying to monitor the spread of uh, fake news through partnership with big information and social media companies such as Twitter, Google and Facebook. Probably if you go on social media, you see that uh, uh, social media give you uh, advice to go to official website. Here I show you an example of my uh, Twitter page. If I write COVID-19 of my Twitter page, Twitter suggests me to go to the Ministero della Salute, that is the Minister of Health in Italy. Despite the efforts made by World Health Organization and uh, social media platforms, hundreds of thousands of people have consumed uh, uh, unreliable contents about the coronavirus on this platform, as suggested by New York Times, uh, YouGov, and Economist uh, survey. This uh, infodemic phenomenon is so huge that epidemiologists are starting to find ways to, me to measure the impact of communication dynamics on epidemics. So the idea is that infodemic uh, and inform uh, information regarding information spreading can, pr you, uh, can be used as a variable to understand um, and to forecast the virus spreading. Uh, as I told you, researchers are starting to work uh, on uh, research related to the current infodemic. So I wish to present you briefly some uh, results uh, related to the content most common, to the rate of information spreading, and to our tendency to share our reliable information. 
Uh, here you can see uh, that some researchers, Nelly and colleagues, uh, through natural language processing techniques, uh, were able to um, understand which were the contents most common in different social media platforms mainstream social media platform where YouTube, Instagram and Twitter and some less known social media platform are Reddit and uh, Gab. We can see that uh, most of the contents are not very uh, alarming. However, uh, there are also some conspiracy related contents, for example, something related Bill Gates Foundation simulation something relating biological warfare, and in general, contents related to racism. Um, people that study infodemiology also wanted to understand, um, to find an index to measure the, uh, the information spreading. Uh, maybe you listen in television and in newspaper about R0. R0 is an index used in epidemiologists uh, to, to say how many people can be affected after being in contact with a, pe with a person with, uh, with uh, that is infected. Uh, uh, infodemiologists try to use the same index to say uh, how many contents are produced after someone is exposed to a content related to COVID-19. They uh, saw that in different social media platforms, the number is between one and three. This means that uh, uh, after being exposed to one content related to COVID, it's possible that people in average produce uh, uh, one to three other contents related to COVID. Of course, these contents are not uh, for sure unreliable. They can be both reliable or uh, unreliable. However, we know from another study and colleagues that people have a tendency to share unreliable information. Uh, researchers ask the participant to consider a mixture of true and false headline about the COVID-19 outbreak. When participants were asked to judge the accuracy of the statement, they said that the fake news was true about 25% of time. However, when they were asked if they would share the headline, around 35% said that they would share a reliable content, 10% more than the, in the other condition. So uh, researchers suggest that uh, even if people uh, can uh, discriminate between uh, f uh, uh, misleading information in uh, a good percentage of the case, when they were asked to share, they are more uh, um, uh, prone to make mistakes. What can we learn as educators uh, from this epidemic? Despite the World Health Organization and government have tried to monitor the epidemic, uh, misleading content probably will continue to spread. That, thus, as we educate, we need to develop the antibodies for the infodemic, and we, can fi we think that these antibodies are critical thinking and digital literacy. We learn also that the methods that uh, people that study infodemic use uh, can be also adopted uh, researchers and educators to study contents that, for example, uh, students share in online discussion forums. Uh, so, uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Katz uh, uh, said before, uh, I will speak a little bit more about critical thinking. I want to say that there is not a, an agreement regarding what critical thinking is. However, researchers agreed with the idea that thinking is composed by both skills, for example, analyze, evaluate, make inference and argument, and the dispositions. Dispositions means to be open-minded, to be skeptical, to be inquisitive, to be reflective. Uh, but why we need uh, critical thinking? Because much of, uh, of uh, our knowledge of the world comes, comes from others rather than being the results of direct experience. 
we need to analyze and evaluate critical information because uh, information received affect our belief and our belief uh, as a consequence affect our behaviors and we are seeing that our behaviors in this case can uh, be uh, very uh, can be very dangerous for ourselves and also for other people so critical thinking has a role not only when we speak about citizenship, uh, when we speak about studying, but for our surviving in this case. Uh, nowadays, a great amount of information change happens online, especially in the case of the uh, so-called infodemic. So, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Katz showed before, there are similarities between uh, critical thinking and digital literacy. Uh, however, according to Ox, uh, reading a text online requires greater challenges uh, compared to reading a text uh, offline. Why? Because of multimodality and because of links that create uh, non sequential kinds of text. So we need not only skills uh, related to text processing, but only also skills related to navigation. Uh, now I want to involve you in a very short quiz and I ask uh, the technical team if they can share the poll with, uh, with the audience. Sorry. Okay, this is the poll. You find three questions and I will explain later more about this free question. I read the question with you. Uh, the first one is, Emily's father has three daughters. The first two are named April and May. What is the third daughter, daughter's name? June, July. We cannot say none of this. The second question is, if you are running a race and you pass the person in second place, what place are you in? First, second, we cannot say none of this. The third question is a, a little bit more challenging because it requires you to go to the OX website. You, are not, you, you, you don't have to do it, but if you want to challenge yourself, you can do it. You have to go to the data section of the OX official website and look for data relating to employment in the ICT sector. ICT employment. Uh, I think part of the question was cut, but I remember the question fortunately. So it is, uh, uh, which country has 4.7% of employment? Maybe I can write you in the chat so you don't have difficulties to remember. Okay. Okay, I'm not, okay, let me see if I can go to the chat. Okay, the here is the chat. 4.7% of employment, which country? I will give you another minute. Percent of employment. Okay. Let me know if uh, all the questions are clear. You can write in the chat, I'm reading you. Especially if with the third question. Okay, all clear, thanks. I don't want to disturb you. Other few seconds. Here we go. I will explain soon the reason of, the, of these questions. Okay. We cannot see the chart.
Okay, I think that we can uh, go on and close. We cannot see the, ch the, the card, but are you, uh, are you speaking about the OX website or are you are not seeing the poll? I don't know what you mean, but uh, I need to go on. So maybe the technical, yes, because I will, I will speak later. This is about our digital literacy skills. So with this, uh, the data from Ox, if you go to the website of Ox, you should see in the data section, but maybe later I can show you some, uh, some uh, way, the way to solve this uh, task. So I, uh, I will go on, we'll uh, speak about uh, um, this uh, uh, assessment uh, me method. The first two questions were not aimed at assessing critical thinking skills, but they were more related with the critical thinking disposition. The, the two items were taken by the cognitive reflection test that is open, and if you want, you can access on the publication and watching uh, the item. And uh, this test is aimed at seeing if we are able to inhibit our, uh, um, uh, our fast and spontaneous answer. For example, in the first uh, item about uh, Emily's daughter, uh, the, um, the first answer would be June, because uh, uh, the, the item asks you uh, about the um, uh, Emily's daughter, the name of the Emily's daughter were April and May. So the first answer that uh, everyone has in mind is June. However, the correct answer is Emily, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, Emily's father has three daughters. One is uh, April, May, and uh, the other one is Emily. I'm so, sorry, Francesca, do you want me to share the results with the attendees of the poll? Um, maybe we can show it now. Yes, we can show it now if you want. Yes. Okay. Okay, so in this case, the correct answer would be none of this because uh, the correct answer would be Emily. The second question was taken both by, uh, uh, also by the uh, uh, cognitive reflective test, and the correct answer was uh, uh, second, was the second. So also in this case, we, are, uh, we ask ourselves to inhibit uh, the fast answer. And uh, okay, perfect. Uh, the correct answer in the third question was uh, ja Japan. The third question was taken by um, uh, the Web Trotter Challenge that is a challenge realized in Italy to assess uh, digital literacy of students in high school. And uh, this key, uh, this, uh, that question was aimed specifically at assessing the skill of uh, um, navigating and a goal-directed goal navigation. So I hope that these examples could be used by you for designing your test. However, I will share the slide with you and you can find all the reference uh, that you can uh, consult in order to design your uh, assessment test. I didn't show you assessment method to assess critical thinking skills because they are uh, uh, larger and more uh, um, require more efforts, of course, because critical thinking requires effort. So let's go on. How can we, de we de develop de de digital and critical thinking skills? Research alight that social interaction and language are fundamental tools for the development of higher order cognitive skills. And when we speak about language, we don't speak only about verbal language, but also mathematical language, figurative language, artistic language. So the critical activities could be deep reading, not only about texts, especially literary texts, because they are more complex, but also pieces of arts. And uh, uh, I would suggest you to look at the massive open online course realized by National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., because they created a very uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, educational resource to understand how to develop critical thinking through art. Another exercise that you can use is writing exercise, especially essays. 
and thirdly, dialogic in turn, both online and offline, from a Socratic uh, tradition. Uh, the good news uh, that are working at the moment online is that uh, online dialogic interaction could be even more, even better than offline uh, interactions. And this because uh, online interaction allow more time for reflecting and allow people during their argumentation, for example, uh, to, uh, to use more references compared to asynchronous uh, discussion. However, uh, if you have big classes of students and you want to monitor uh, discussion forums, it can be challenging. Thus, uh, um, recently, educators with cognitive scientists and uh, uh, computer scientists are working to together and they developed a new research that is named Learning and Analytics and Educational Data, uh, data Mining. There, uh, there is a growing number of attempts to automatically analyze critical thinking related sub-skills through natural language processing techniques. And uh, Professor Pocha and her team, uh, in which I am included, uh, work on uh, this. And, uh, however, this is uh, a new field uh, and we need uh, more research. Uh, and our goal is to support the teachers in the future, providing them tools uh, to monitor critical thinking of, of their students in a discussion forums. And for this reason, at the end of this presentation, I will put uh, in uh, the chat uh, a link that uh, would continue my PhD thesis research. So I would be very grateful if you can participate in my uh, research at the end of this presentation. And uh, there are someone that will put the, the link also on YouTube. To sum up, uh, the current infodemic is making more evident than uh, that citizens need to develop critical thinking skills and digital skills. Uh, critical thinking skills and digital, uh, critical, uh, digital, thinking, uh, digital literacy skills uh, could be developed in a learning environment, combining deep reading, writing activities, and dialogic activities. And we can learn from Infodemic some methodological tools, tools to assess critical thinking and digital literacy uh, in e-learning platform in the same way that uh, researchers work on social media platforms. I want to let you with a provocative thought by uh, Tobelli that wrote an essay that I suggest you to read uh, that is named Avoid News. Go without news. Cut it, cut it out completely. After a while, you will realize that despite your personal news blackout, you have not missed and you are not uh, going to miss any important facts. If some bit of information is truly important to your profession, your company, your family or your community, you will learn it in time for your friends, your mother-in-law or whomever you talk to or see. When you are with your friends, ask them if anything important is happening in the world. The question is a great conversation starter. Most of the time, the answer will be not really. This is a provocative thought. I'm not suggesting you to not read the news, but I suggest you to read the essay from Tob Tobelli. And thank you for your time. And I hope uh, that it, it was interesting for you. Absolutely, Francesca, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, comments are coming in, in the chat, Congr congratulating you, so thank you so much. I think we, we have uh, uh, a little bit of time for a, at least a couple of questions uh, for each uh, uh, of our uh, presenters. Um, I wanted to, to, to start with Irv and then we'll come back to, to Francesca with a very interesting um, topic that actually has uh, a, a true impact on, well, on health and, and well-being. So we need to, to really understand uh, the, the relevance and the importance of, uh, of such uh, uh, an issue like infodemic, uh, um, because the the relation uh, with uh, health and well-being is is very strong, and it it can be really ample. Uh, Irv, my question to you comes from 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 the audience, of course, and is related to 
the topic of metacognitive skills. Mm, uh, how are they associated with digital skills? And if they are associated, in what way? Can you, can you um, uh, widen a bit the, the concept that was there in your presentation, but maybe we can give more details about that? Sure. Hmm. Um, so metacognitive skills, skills about knowing what you're thinking about and being more self-reflective are an essential part of um, digital literacy. And in fact, is something that the committees that, that I've worked with that have defined, that were defining these skills talked about a lot. Um, it's not specifically put anywhere because it pervades the entire um, sets of skills. Uh, number one, so for example, just in evaluation, you have to be uh, reflective about what things you are being persuaded by and therefore what things you need to be skeptical about. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and then, um, but importantly, and this was a point I raised all the way at the end of the, uh, of the talk, how do we apply these skeptical, uh, critical thinking, digital literacy skills? How do we recognize this is a situation where I need to, to think hard? As, as Francesca pointed out, it, it's very time consuming and cognitively exhausting it can be to engage in these types of activities. So we're going to be a little bit, I wouldn't say necessarily lazy, but let's say careful about when we, when we, um, when we look at this. And so you have to be, um, you have to have some awareness and self-reflection about the situations in which you tend to be um, fooled and the types of things that you tend to find compelling and not compelling um, in order to uh, improve your own uh, digital literacy and critical thinking. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, and what about uh, uh, assessment? You, you, uh, mentioned assessment, of course, in your in your presentation, and some uh, some examples were, were given. But do you think uh, that um, we should work on different ways uh, of uh, assessing certain skills in order to support and enhance them? I know that uh, there are different problems in, especially in. Um, reliability and validity, uh, of course. But um, can you tell us, you know, which is which could be the direction assessment could take, also to help uh, the enhancement of, of certain skills? Well, when it comes to <coughs> sorry, <coughs> when it comes to um, assessment, one of the things that when we were developing the assessment. Uh, that the examples uh, I showed um, during the presentation, uh, we, you know, obviously we're ETS, so we paid very careful attention to validity and reliability uh, issues. But I think the important thing is that the assessments and questions need to reflect scenarios and situations that people come across. So that when they come across these things in the real life, they 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 hopefully would see the uh, to see the connection. Of course, assessment is just a measure, and we're measuring how well people can recognize these situations. They do know that it's an assessment, so that that means that it's um, they might not um, <coughs> they might not apply the skills uh, in the real world, but um, instruction should uh, focus on a wide variety of cases and situations and ideally bring in things from the person's own um, own experience and life so that they begin to see the connections between what they're, for example, learning in the classroom and what's actually happening in the, uh, in the real world. These aren't new ideas, but <coughs> when it comes to digital literacy and critical thinking, they're important because recognizing the situations in which you need to apply these skills is um, is critical. Critical, absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you. So, um, Francesca, 
can you give us? Uh, mm, uh, I have a lot of questions, but but uh, um, I would like you to uh, um, expand on the relation uh, that. Uh, um, deep breathing um, and um, relevant cultural issues uh, um, could bring to critical thinking enhancement. I mean, um, relevant cultural uh, references uh, could be in, in the literary world, could be in, uh, in the heart uh, and heritage world. So, which is the relation that you could see and how we could exploit the availability of heritage resources in order to, to expand, to support uh, critical thinking skills? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I will start uh, with the literary text and then we can explore also what's happened with pieces of arts. Literary texts, uh, especially classic one, are characterized by complexity. So when you read a, lit a classic text, usually you uh, can find very different lo lo layers. So uh, you can read, read, read again and um, Train uh, and uh, train in this way uh, your ability to analyze, uh, to and evaluate. Uh, so this is uh, one of the reasons why literary texts uh, could be uh, exploited uh, by um, uh, teachers that want to develop critical thinking in uh, uh, their students. And uh, in the same way, pieces of arts uh, could be used uh, to develop, for example, inquis inquisitiveness. So uh, students can focus on details presented in uh, pieces of arts and try to make inferences, uh, hypotheses regarding why that uh, element is presented in that kind of pa painting. What is the reason why the artist put that element in that painting? So uh, these are some reasons why uh, literary texts and pieces of arts uh, could be used. And uh, with the... Um, in relation with pieces of arts, we have a methodology named visual thinking that has been shown to be very useful for uh, the development of uh, critical thinking. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, that, that's why we, we, we need to uh, increase uh, cultural um, heritage. Uh, fruition in different in different ways. So there are, there are different different reasons. Um, there are lots of other questions I, I would like to ask you, but time is uh, uh, really uh, running. Uh, we will have the opportunity to answer uh, your questions uh, um, uh, in in you know also asynchronously. Um, this, uh, um, th there are questions related to, to projects uh, going on uh, um, on uh, our topics, and we'll, we're going to to uh, to give you information related to to those uh, projects. We have many uh, going. Uh, I would like to remind all uh, the audience uh, that uh, we are going to have uh, to go to, to give you other opportunities uh, to participate in our online together uh, initiative. Um, the next. Uh, opportunity uh, will be uh, it's very 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 close uh, because immediately uh, next uh, uh, next Wednesday uh, we are going to have uh, a webinar uh, promoted by Eden through the network of academics and uh, professionals um, that is uh, due on on Wednesday, May 13th, and the title is very intriguing again, Teaching Online Competencies, a Debate in a Post-Confinement uh, Scenario, uh, with uh, Alfredo Soheiro, uh, Eden EC member from the University of Porto, Ulf Daniel Ehlers, Eden EC 
uh, member, Cooperative State University Baden-Württemberg, Germany. And uh, the webinar will be moderated by Francesca Amenduni as uh, uh, newly elected uh, um, Network of Academics and Professional uh, Steering Committee member. Uh, the next uh, Eden Online Together uh, Initiative webinar will be on May 18th, uh, always at 5 uh, Central um, European Summertime. Uh, the topic uh, is Education in Time of Pandemic, Practical Tips for Learning and Instructional Design with Joyce Seitzner. Nightgare. Uh, sorry, I can pronounce the name. Jared Evans, uh, Open University UK. Gilly Salmon, uh, UK Academic Director at Online Education Services, and will be moderated by uh, Fabio uh, Nashimbeni. I ask you so to uh, don't forget and register to those uh, uh, events. Uh, I also recommend you to uh, visit our website and get information about our annual conference that will take place um, online this year, uh, hosted by University Politecnica Timisoara. Uh, and I can tell you that submissions are still open, so it would be a good very good opportunity to share our ideas, our projects, our project results, and have a further interaction uh, together. Uh, I think it's all for today. I thank you uh, again, our presenters. Uh, uh, Irv, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. I am confident that there will be more opportunities to talk about critical thinking development and assessment. Uh, thank you, Francesca, for your very live present and interactive presentation. Uh, you will have the opportunity as uh, um, uh, NAP steering committee uh, member to promote more your research and your uh, findings. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to the Secretariat that hosted uh, the meeting. And uh, we are anyway available for any further uh, inquiry. Thank you all.